hoće li nam upotreba tehnologije omogućiti pogled u budućnost. Hoćemo li znati od čega ćemo bolovati ili čak umreti? Možda ćemo ipak uspeti da izlečimo ove bolesti i budemo zdraviji. Hoćemo li živeti 150 godina? Brže nego što očekujemo, opisivat ćemo svoje simptome animiranom lekaru i daljina više neće biti prepreka za dobijanje najbolje medicinske zaštite. A pravi doktori medicine s kojima ćemo se susretati u ordinacijama donosit će odluke drugačije nego danas. Sistem zdravstvene zaštite počivat će na upotrebi takozvanih velikih podataka. I naučnici i lekari poput preduzetnika i stručnjaka u oblasti marketinga u stanju su da prikupe ogromne količine informacija. Potom tragaju za vezama koje postoje među, na prvi pogled, raznorodnim podacima. Već se, zahvaljujući tome, donekle mogu predvideti epidemije, sprečiti neke bolesti, smanjiti troškovi lečenja i unaprediti uslovi života. U svijetu biomedicine možete gledati the relationship between mutations and disease. You can look at the effect of environmental factors, in some cases socio-demographic variables, and how all of them interact to contribute to some health outcome. So the benefit of using big data is we can begin to perhaps find cures to diseases. We can begin to understand impact for environmental sciences. We can begin to see how we can leverage data to see how information flows. We can um, detect early signs. These are diseases that are degenerative, like diabetes, but you can control, once you detect, early detection is key to controlling these kind of things. And big data plays a big role in being able to do this. Ovo je veoma uzbudljivo vreme. Veliki podaci i tehnologija promenili su način na koji prikupljamo analiziramo i primenjujemo podatke u svim oblastima života. U biomedicini se očekuje revolucija u vidu medicine koja je prilagođena svakom pojedincu. Imagine if you went to the hospital. Um, now the, the paradigm in medicine is for us to tell the doctors how we feel. But imagine if there was another way of doing this. Imagine you go into a room and somehow some machine samples different parts of your body and then they tell you that these are problems. Your skin cells are not regenerating at a fast rate because certain genes are actually not being activated. Maybe it tells you that your hair follicles are, they, they look fine to you in the mirror, but in fact the certain genes are not um, being expressed um, because there's some epigenomic phenomenon that's taking place that can be fixed. So, I think that's where medicine eventually will lead, where we might not need a doctor or ourselves to self-report what's the problem. Big data basically tells us what the problems are, and then we could fix those problems before they become worse. Samo u jednom danu na svetu nastane 2,5 kvintiliona ili 2,5 miliona 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 podataka. Da biste stekli uvid koliko je to zapravo, Ovom veličinom se označava težina zemljene kugle u tonama ili broj neurona u ljudskom mozgu. Osim što su toliko mnogobrojni, veliki podaci su veoma raznoliki, razlikuju se prema vrsti, načinu nastajanja, učestalosti. Zapravo, biomedicinske nauke koriste alate koji se već odavno upotrebljavaju u drugim oblastima. Google, Amazon, Facebook podavno su počeli da koriste algoritme za predviđanje naših sklonosti, Koja knjiga ili film bi nas zanimali, koju hranu ili koji model pametnog telefona da nam ponude? Tako, metode i sistemi pomoću kojih upravljaju našim podacima na internetu mogu se primeniti i u oblasti zdravstvene zaštite. When you were born, you had one cell, again, genomes from mom and dad, and over time those cells became two, four, eight, and split into the 60 trillion cells that we are today. So yes, there is a lot of information in our body. Um, and that information um, is mutating all the time because our cells replicate. So sometimes you look in the mirror 
um, in the morning. And, and when you s what you see is the culmination of genomics from your mom and dad. But it's also the culmination of mutational processes that have taken place in the development or the lifetime of, of your cells. Podaci o kojima govorimo nastaju prilikom rutinskih poseta lekaru, specijalističkih pregleda, rada u naučno-istraživačkim laboratorijama, analizom genoma. Stalan dotok informacija o zdravlju i navikama korisnika omogućavaju i pametni telefoni i ostali uređaji koje stalno nosimo, poput Fitbita ili pametnog sata. Ukoliko se ovakvi podaci sačuvaju na odgovarajući način obrade i učine dostupnim, postaju veliki podaci. So we are able to make conclusions which we weren't able to make before. Uh, we can standardize things that, like labs and tests that doctors run, um, which we thought we knew the answers to before, but we didn't really now that we see it. Every time you invent an instrument, a way of measuring, you have a way to get a different kind of data, right? So for example, um, until the genome sequencing came along, we did not have genomic sequences. Uh, then we had uh, microarrays and we could measure the expression levels of genes. And, uh, you know, now we can do protein assays, uh, so you, you know the, uh, the amount of protein that's there. Now you can do the microbiome, which gives you the entire, you know, pop uh, population of microbes that live in your gut, uh, for example. We are now uh, in an amazing moment in, in many respects. Uh, the, due to technology advances, we, we actually have an amazing ability to collect and store data. In the past, uh, we did not have that ability. In the past, doctors had to rely on their experience. They do not have the collection of data from you know, a period of time, so they have to make a judgment based on the now. Having data makes us all empiricist and makes us all, instead of having theoretical hypotheses, we can validate them uh, and, and experiment with the models that we have at scale that we couldn't imagine before. Now with this longitudinal analysis, you actually have the transition. So you can actually study how this particular disease has progressed and what steps uh, seem to work for a particular patient. So what works for you in terms of treatment for different types of problems may not work for the next person, may not work for the third person. So it has to be somewhat personalized. And big data doesn't have to be, or data doesn't have to be analyzed in a very extravagant manner. You can just average things and say, okay, the standard glucose level for individuals who don't have diabetes is X. Right? If you have more than that, uh, when you're fasting, well, then maybe you're in diabe a diabetic. And how do you know that X? Well, the doctor said averaged over time. So it's not a very complicated way of looking at data. Pre svega, ako pričamo o biomedicini, ono što se u Srbiji najviše radi, to je analiza mutacijonog statusa široke palete gena koji se vezuju za određene bolesti, Ono što je najvažnije i najtragičnije, to je kancer. Armija ljudi ovde radi na genezi podataka koji ukazuju na konkretne promene u genomu koji su ili uzručnik samog nastanka kancera ili protagonista njegovog napredovanja. Osim toga, ta vrsta analiza se koreliše sa kliničkim statusom i to su sve u stvari podaci u ovom slučaju Kada govorimo o jednom timu, mali, ali će, nadam se, biti deo podataka za velike analize. Količina podataka kojom već sada raspolažemo zahteva kreiranje alata kojima će se oni analizirati, drugih koji će pronalaziti povezanost među njima koju nije lako uočiti. Potom sve to treba primeniti na savršenom, ali i veoma osetljivom modelu, čoveku, pri čemu treba sačuvati njegovu privatnost i dostojanstvo. If you wear spectacles or if you have some kind of um, um, vision uh, issues. So you go every year, um, the doctor spends uh, about 
usually, if you go to a good place, anywhere from one and a half to three hours examining different parts of your eyes, they take images. They have specialized devices that take images, not just of what is visible to you and I um, right now, but at the back of your retina, to your optic nerve head, to your cornea. These images uh, usually are very high resolution. Okay, so they end up with about, you know, you can, from a particular patient visit, you can extract um, up to 7,000 different types of features from these, from these visits. If I know where you live, where you work, and how you travel, I can get information about all of your environmental exposures, like the, what's the pollution uh, where you live, right, or where you work. Uh, do you get exposed to smoke? You know, as in somebody else smoking, maybe you're not the one smoking. Do you, so, so uh, all of those things. And then uh, the socio-demographic, the l larger social context in which you live. But knowing where one comes from allows us to connect the dots. So if you are an individual, you don't know your origins as, as well as others do, you might be able to connect to some of the diseases that that population is, is stuck with um, because different populations have higher frequencies of certain types of disease. So by sequencing your DNA, you could also connect to a population that has been characterized for certain types of disease and then go to a doctor and say, by the way, I come from this population, these are where my genes come from, and I know that these populations have a certain frequency of these types of diseases, so therefore I'd like to be tested for that. So that could also be a very, um, very advantageous reason for sequencing your, disease, your, your genomes. I can try to predict um, how healthy you are, you will be, what kind of drugs you may need if you are not healthy, how to optimize your lifestyle, maybe how to save you money on the gym or on health insurance. Uh, you could do just about anything. You could also you know, try to predict whether you're going to have 10 kids or two kids or if your kids are gonna turn out okay. Doesn't mean I'll be right, but I can try to predict it. If you have a particular problem, you go regularly. You go once a month or you go once a year or something like that. So you have a longitudinal um, uh, piece of information on each patient. So this gets collected. This is then has to be transformed into a set of useful features that can then predict you know, whether you have uh, either the, the, the disease or the problem or you are having a precursor before the disease manifests itself. So the question is really, is there a doctor who can understand the predictions that are made. Doesn't have to be an, a medical doctor right now, but maybe a doctor in the future. And are just understanding disease, do we have the means of treating it? So I could tell you that there is a disease, but if we don't have drugs for it, that's it, right? Imamo i imaćemo terabajte i terabajte podataka koje moramo analizirati kako bismo bolje sagledali problemi i došli do rešenja za kojim tragamo. Za to nam je potreba naučni pristup analizi podataka, data science, kao i tehnologija koja će nam obezbediti da njima rukujemo, big data. Treba li reći da nema nezaposlenih data naučnika? Za upotrebu velikih podataka u biomedicini potrebno je specifično obrazovanje. Prema mišljenju mnogih, buduće generacije lekara trebalo bi da imaju u kurikulumu više računarstva, statistike, matematike, kako bi umeli da izađu na kraj sa sve prisutnijim velikim podacima. Ja mislim da nije uputno da lekari postaju informatičari, oni imaju mnogo ozbiljnijeg posla, mislim imaju mnogo ozbiljnog posla u svojim klinikama, oni treba da generišu te podatke, a mnogo je bolja varijanta da se u celu priču uključe i sarađuju i da samo jedan tako multidisciplinarni tim koji će biti sastavljen od lekara, biologa, molekularnih biologa, matematičara, pa i hemičara, može na kraju dovesti do dobrih rezultata i pravilne analize te mase podataka. The question is, how do we actually get all that data? Which cells do we sample for this personalized medicine? Which, which data do we ignore? Which data do we actually use? Um, another issue is not just with the missing data, but also with messy data. 
How do we sanitize a data set? And this has always been a problem with, with um, extracting data. So the idea then to train these people to use these kind of big data technologies or uh, analysis mechanisms is to get them to uh, take what they know about these models and teach them or explain to them how some of these other advanced classification or early de detection mechanisms can be used. In fact, some of the work we've done in this space, part of it is educating some of these folks. So now these ideas are actually used in clinics, not just nationwide, but worldwide. Some of the ideas that my group and others have developed. We U stanju su i da zapamte kada smo uzimali terapiju ili koristili inkalator i da sve te informacije preko takozvanih oblaka ili klauda proslede lekaru. Sva je prilika da ćemo imati svoj genetički profil koji će na ostavu podata kao nama i našim dnevnim navikama moći da nas upozori da možemo razviti neku bolest ukoliko ne promenimo ponašanje. Međutim, primjena dostignuća informacijonih i drugih naprednih tehnologija u biomedicini drastično menja oblast privatnosti i bezbednosti ličnih informacija. Privacy issues are a big deal. You should not be forced to release information which has been collected about you unless it's some kind of a criminal investigation and I guess even there I think it would be a problem. Um, what, what is important to remember is that when it comes down to genetics or to your habits even, you're not only releasing your own information, you're releasing information to people who are related to you, for instance, your children, um, that your genome is half of their genome. So basically, uh, privacy issues become even more so problematic. What is, on the other hand, important is all of these entities that would actually use this data to do something, what is that something? Well, if they are these ideal fairy tale uh, entities, they would only use it to help you, nothing else. But the reality is probably not. Probably this is going to be used to profile you in a way which is not a good thing for you. I teach at a university that's one of the largest in the country. We have about 60,000 students in the university. That university, every student, as far as I know, um, almost without exception, carries some kind of Fitbit or something like that that is generating data about their health. And so they have cell phones which are collecting data about where they are, what they are doing, how fast they are walking. You have Fitbits that is collecting more sensitive data, personalized data. And I could have data from my variables which is giving my steps, etc. Combine that with my electronic medical records, which are stored differently and captured differently. Combine that perhaps with uh, other aspects of me, my demographic features, etc. So when you have these varying modalities of data, how do we even begin to put them together? If you look at the kind of data that's being collected about individuals, that's the kind of big data which has led to this GDPR. The, the, one, of the, one of the tenets of GDPR is um, you have to assert or specify what data is being collected by each individual in, in the EU. You have to be able to explain how you're using this data to the individual. You have to be able to explain how you came at your decision. 2008 in the US, uh, George Bush um, signed a bill called the Genetic Non-Discrimination Act, which made it illegal for anyone to use genetic information for for um, insurance purposes or for any other purposes. So basically, it gave privacy to people giving their genetic data. And I think if every country in the world did that, it'd be much better. Do we need some government regulation on this? Obviously, we do. Um, I am a scientist, so I am a little hesitant to say that everything should be held in a box somewhere far away because I want to do research on that. But uh, the truth is, uh, the world will have to develop new ways of dealing with the fact that there is this privacy that is being lost via data collection. So, a framework where, and let's assume that you know we have the guardrails of security, privacy, do no evil, uh, avail provided. Let's assume a utopic world, and each one of us is able to and willing to contribute and share our data about my 
data from my variables, data from my, about my sleep, data about my health, data about everything else. And then imagine that system could now find similarities amongst us and say, hey, people like you, Nitesh, with these factors, with these lifestyle, with this socioeconomic condition, with this in physical environment, had these kind of risks. You should, be, you should watch out for this. And, this. and based on who you are, these kind of interventions may work. You know, this was not normally part of the training of computer scientists and so on, but I think uh, now we have to, uh, because we, are do we will be touching these kinds of data, we also have to do it ethically. And so the training in a sort of ethics of data is a new topic almost, right? So people know about research ethics, but data ethics, what does it mean for me to have access to somebody else's data? And under what circumstances should I use it in a particular way? At least in the case of academic research, there are uh, checks and balances on how things get done. So for example, most places have this institutional review of a research protocol and so on. But what uh, uh, data is being collected by commercial entities and how it's being used, that's much more fuzzy. It's not clear, right? Because data is being used, our data is being used without our knowledge or consent, and it's not uh, clear who owns that data. Geni određuju ne samo našu visinu, boju kose i očiju. Genom sadrži biološku informaciju koja nas čini različitim od svih drugih. Na osnovu upoznavanja genoma imat ćemo uvid u budućnost, u to koje nam bolesti prete, te ćemo moći da ih izbegnemo. Postoji mnogo drugih bolesti koje imaju genetičku osnovu ili su posledica nekih mutacija koje nastaju tokom života. Dakle, očekujem da big data analiza na kraju dovede do identifikacije samog uzročnika i naravno do identifikacije ciljnih gena ili ciljnih molekula koje treba gađati u terapiji. Konsekvenca je da je da bi imali bolje različe da je 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 but you, you maintain health because you understand this and then you can intervene. In some cases, the intervention may not be even at the individual level. It may be a policy, uh, sort of public policy kinds of interventions where uh, you regulate how the environment's built environment operates. So people live uh, within walking distance of work. Maybe they have healthier places to um, healthier food, uh, these sorts of things. Stanje zdravlja ili bolesti ne određuju pojedinačni parametri. To su kompleksni sistemi koje ćemo moći da sagledavamo sve bolje kako budemo uspešniji u integraciji velikih podataka. Tada ćemo moći da vidimo ono što do sada nismo. Bićemo u stanju da postavljamo nova pitanja i dobijemo nove hipoteze, iz kojih će možda proizaći nova i velika otkrića. I can imagine big data being part of every aspect of our life where every morning we get up and we have genomic and transcriptomic tests and that informs us on whether we should go see a doctor for a certain problem. Uh, there was a paper uh, some, uh, a few years ago that uh, had an interesting uh, sort of title that your yeah, zip code, zip code in the US means the location, right? So it's like a postal code. Zip code uh, could be more important for your health than your genetic code. And that's true in some cases. So for example, if you s live in some neighborhoods where you don't have access to reasonable uh, sources of food, you would end up eating in you know, McDonald's and then you have consequences of that. So health is a much more complicated thing. And we heard a little bit about this epigenetic uh, very, you know, factors, right? Where uh, during your lifetime, your exposure to stress is going to cause changes that you, some of which are actually passed on uh, to your children, and it's not ju just your genes, but the, uh, uh, you know what what, your, what the environment did to you. Right? We could build sensing which could detect uh, air pollutants, and we could say, okay, you know, create warnings for that when that happens. We could have sensing for uh, you know nowadays watches have the sensing the heart rate goes in a danger zone that can create an alert. So we could definitely leverage data to create these sensing mechanisms 
which can save lives. And not just for humans, we can even think about uh, some of the other work that we do is how invasive species go through the world and, or how epidemiology or disease spread happens. If we can model those effectively, we can save lives. If you're doing mosquito genomes, we can figure out cures for malaria, we can figure out cures for cancer, uh, or accelerate that process, so absolutely. Yeah, I, I think that would be the ultimate in personalized medicine. I think having data sets at our fingertip and analyses at our fingertip would be wonderful. I think this would be a, a paradigm shift in the way that we do medicine. Um, it would save on medical costs. It would save on unnecessary pain and suffering. Um, it's, it's, it's essentially um, having a doctor with you at all times. <laughs>